John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. The President of the United States, the State of the Union message concluded. Members of Congress responding. And we're very, very pleased to welcome two members of the 112th Congress, two members of the majority party of the 112th Congress, representing 21st Congressional District of California, Devin Nunes of the San Joaquin Valley, and representing the 11th District of the state of Michigan, that's Livonia, Western Detroit, Thaddeus McCotter. Devin and I begin with the uh, significance that in the San Joaquin Valley, what weighs upon your constituents and the people of California is joblessness and the corresponding crash of housing prices uh, and the crisis that that has created throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Did you hear that directly addressed tonight as you set through the joint session? John, thanks for having me on. This is actually the first time I've been on your show with Thaddeus McCotter since the night we did Broadway, the Hard Hard Rock Cafe. So That's it's, right. It's a pleasure to be on with, with both of you again. Uh, look, this is a – I thought the speech was a, a cross between George W. Bush uh, when it came to national security and, and kind of Governor Moonbeam in a way where he was promising teachers everything and jobs and high-speed rail and green jobs. And, you know, quite frankly, this is something that's been tried in California been tried in my area where we've taken socialist utopian policies uh, for now a few decades in California, and it's resulted in the highest unemployment rate in the country, uh, which exists in the San Joaquin Valley, California, my district. Uh, he, he talked about government regulations. Uh, this is a man who, who, the president, who did absolutely nothing to solve the water crisis in the San Joaquin Valley, where he's let hundreds of thousands of acres of the most prime farm ground uh, in the world go fallow, and he's sitting there lecturing us about uh, about government regulations, uh, you know, to, where he cut off water to save a, a Delta smelt fish. Uh, you know, look, this, this falls on deaf ears with me. I don't believe it, and I think the country's in a lot of trouble unless the Republicans are, are willing to stand up and do something. Thaddeus, good evening to you. Uh, the President of the United States uh, talked much of spending 100,000 new teachers, infrastructure. He talked about high-speed rail. He talked about investing in uh, green jobs. He mentioned solar energy. Uh, footnote, solar energy is entirely in the hands of our Chinese competitors because of what is uh, straightforward understood as piratical practices of subsidizing their solar energy business that crushed and pushed out of the market Silicon Valley and innovation in this country. But, Thaddeus, the point here is that the president listed a lot of spending I thought that that's what the 112th Congress is about to rein in, not to increase. How did you hear it, Thaddeus? Well, I think I heard it pretty much the same way, John. And when you look at it overall, it's still the continuing debate. The president has continued his call to increase and sustain the massive increase that they've done over the last two years of the welfare state, which is now outmoded in the age of globalization. And so when you see him talk investments, he can call it anything he wants, but it's more spending, and it's still the same spending and the same type of picking winners and losers that we've seen since the Sin Fuels Corps of Carter, et cetera, et cetera. And what I think was missing from both uh, presentations was the reality that it is the 21st century model of government that has to start being created here, and that's going to be one that recognizes the personal empowerment and the changes that have occurred in the global economy to make it consumer-driven and match it with a citizen-driven government, back to self-government, limited government, a responsible social safety net, and an end to a concept that somehow you're entitled to somebody else's, uh, the fruits of somebody else's labor. We're not getting anywhere. We're still arguing whether we're going to have a bloated government or a bigger government, and that is not what the American people in their daily lives are experiencing. Nor is it what we believe was uh, a forwarded, uh, was advanced by the American people at the midterm election, which is why Thaddeus McCotter and Devin Nunes sit in a comfortable majority in the House of Representatives. And in the Senate, there is effectively a working Republican majority because of the number of senators, Democrats, who face re-election, difficult re-election in red states within two years. Devin, the President of the United States, in talking about his plans and his programs, I got to the health care part, 40, 40 minutes, 35 minutes into the speech, and I did not hear him address the concerns that were voiced in the House of Representatives when you voted to repeal and re- begin the replacing 245 to 189 a week ago. Did he miss that vote, Devin? Was that left out of this draft tonight? I, it's important to mention one important point on the only part that President Obama was actually specific on. 
and when it, in regards to health care. He mentioned the 1099 provision, tax provision. Right. He called it a flaw. It was a flaw that he knowingly supported when the bill, when it was put into the bill originally. So this is where we get the rhetoric versus reality. So the rhetoric is he's uh, now that he's never seen this before, he didn't know about it, and this is nonsense. So we talked about it on the floor numerous times. We sent letters uh, over to the White House and to Speaker Pelosi at the time when they passed the health care bill, and to now stand up there and say that they didn't know anything about this 1099 provision that is going to encumber small business in this country with unprecedented uh, uh, black, uh, red tape. It, it's just incredible to me that, that he can stand up there and say this. So, so this is uh, the reality of health care is this, that you have Medicare and Medicaid that are threatening to bankrupt this country. You had Obamacare, which is now two new entitlements on top of the old broken government programs that are, that are broke, and now all this is encompassing. So any talk about solving the deficit problem or, or getting better health care to Americans all this president did is is basically put in perpetuity the bankrupting of health care in this country, which Republicans now have to fix, and hopefully this president begins to get it soon. Uh, Thaddeus, uh, the president asks us to move forward. Move forward from what? From a flaw in the 1099 piece, from the arguments of last year? How did he mean that remark in your in your mind? Well, I think he wants the... In- the- decrepit welfare state to limp along into the 21st century and continue to cost us money and control more of our personal decisions. Again, John, I can't make this more clear. We live in the 21st century, in the palm of your hand on a BlackBerry or a cell phone. You can communicate around the globe to friends. You can purchase a good or service. You have more control over your life than anyone had ever dreamt in human history. And now we're continuing to talk about the government taking more of your money, spending more of your money, controlling more of your decisions, and it is absolutely backwards. So what I take away from it is the more I hear the president talk about big government, however he garbs it, as being progress, he is mistaken. The continuation of the mistakes and the unsustainable model of government that we have now is called regression, not progress. Uh, Devin, the president talked about the tax cuts that were resolved with a compromise in December during the lame duck, and then he said that he's going to uh, very much advance the case that they should be repealed, go away, in two years' time. He's promising a fight ahead. That first doesn't sound like uh, this is all get along to go along. That first sounds like he's laying down a marker. However, those tax cuts are very popular. Did the president mean to call you out on that, Devin? How did you hear it? I'm not sure that the, that the tax cuts are necessarily popular or unpopular. Uh, what's popular for him was that he was able to strike a bipartisan accord and then followed that up with the Tucson speech. And so he's riding this wave of bipartisanship, knowing that this is his only path to reelection. Uh, when you look at, let's just back up again, and what did the president, the president campaigned on letting the Bush tax cuts expire. Right. He was campaigning for president. He railed on it in the Senate. Uh, this is a guy who, who, if reality hit him in the face, he, he wouldn't know it. Uh, and then, let's also back up, what did he say about earmarks? He said that he will not sign a bill that has earmarks in it. This is a guy who signed in earmarks over and over and over again after he promised in his presidential campaign that he wouldn't do it. So here we are. Uh, who to believe? Uh, I, I think we already know uh, who not to believe. That is uh, the question about um, my concern here about foreign policy. The president talked about us being at war and uh, threats to our security. But I didn't hear uh, him talk about the challenges ahead. I talked, uh, he talked about Iran, Iraq, leaving Iraq. He talked about the doubts we have about Iran. He talked about Afghanistan. Uh, did he indicate to you one path of foreign policy? Is there an Obama policy that you heard tonight, that is? No, I didn't. And I will tie it to the economy, John. We, I'm from Michigan, and let me just say that when the president talked about the trade agreements, and he talked about competition and how he would enforce trade agreement violations, right. and how we would not have trade agreements that were disadvantageous to American workers, uh, the one billion person elephant in the room was Mr. Hu's Communist China, which was just feted over here uh, by this White House. 
So when we talk about trade sanctions, we talk about fair trade, or we talk about leveling the playing field, or not trading with people, uh, regimes that don't respect their own people's rights, and yet you give communist China a pass, a country that, as you pointed out, has engaged in mercantilist trade practices, has engaged in predatory trade practices, their currency valuation. If you do not understand that economics is part of the new nature of competition amongst nations, if you do not understand the debt threat that causes problems to the United States, both in terms of our fiscal debt to, to other nations, as well as our trade imbalance and the gutting of American manufacturing, if you leave communist China out of your equation, both in terms of strategic and economic considerations, that does not constitute... That is McCotter and Devin Nunes. I'm John